The number three best chess game of the 1960s is Rashid Gibyatovich Nezhmetdinov versus Oleg Chernikov from 1962. Now, Nezhmetdinov is something of a cult hero in modern chess. He is renowned for his attacking style of play and for being one of the strongest players to never become a grandmaster. He was a five-time Russian champion, and in 20 games against the world chess champions, he had a plus score. Fans of Nezhmet Dinov will be excited to see that in the new Netflix series, The Queen's Gambit, there was a tribute to him. It was his combination against Kasparian that Beth Harmon used to defeat Harry Beltic to win the Kentucky State Championship. Now, this game here is incredibly famous. It has been justifiably called the greatest queen sacrifice ever played. There's a good chance that you have seen a Godmature's video on this game, or possibly you have seen King's Crusher's very originally titled take on the same game. Now, as we revisit this in doing the best chess games of the 1960s, I'll be trying to add some originality to the notes by looking at modern neural network engines, particularly Stockfish 12. They have a great sense of what works in intuitive sacrifices and they will add some depth to the analysis here. I will also be drawing on some great notes from Nezhmet Dina's friend Voloshin, who was with him at this tournament and participated in the post-game analysis on this very game. This game opens with a Sicilian defense, an accelerated dragon Sicilian defense, and at the time, this was theoretically relevant. There's still possibly some theoretical relevance today. Now, a very interesting note is that after bishop b3, the move knight a5 had been tried for a while, but it was ended in the game Fischer versus Ryshevsky when Fischer played e5. Now, this was known analysis to Russian players, but evidently Ryshevsky did not know it, and he blundered here with knight back to e8 when Fisher played bishop takes f7 check, a beautiful move. Both rook takes f7 and king takes f7 are met with the incredible move knight to e6, which traps the black queen right here. Now, if the king captures, then Fisher had a successful attack coming with queen to d5, and the king is actually soon getting checkmated. That, however, is a story for another day. In this game, after bishop b3 instead of knight a5, we get knight to g4, a superior move, and now queen takes g4, knight takes d4, queen h4, queen to a5, and castles. At this point, after bishop f6, I will read to you some comments from Volishin. Here it is, the theoretically drawn position. The queen cannot go to g3 or f4 since black sacrifices the queen on c3 and obtains a great advantage after the knight fork on e2. The retreat of the queen to d1 after queen g4 d5 is logically inconsistent. The queen could have gone to d1 a couple of moves earlier without giving black extra tempi. A draw by repetition will occur if white moves his queen from h6 to h4 while black attacks it with bishop g7 and bishop f6. This position had already been seen in tournament play and the opponents invariably began peace negotiations. Here, Chernikov was certain that Nezhmetdinov had decided to get some rest that day. Incidentally, I am not able to recall a single instance where Nezhmetdinov had that in mind when he sat down to play. He loved chess too much to take a day off at the board and not be creative. 20, 30, 40 minutes went by and White was still thinking. Chernikov was strolling around. Do you know what Rashid Gibyatovich is thinking about for so long? He asked as he turned to me. It is a dead draw. If he wanted to go on playing, he should have thought earlier. At that moment, an excited boy ran up to Chernikov and said, Mister, he sacrificed his queen to you. I did not see Chernikov stroll around anymore after that. The queen sacrifice that the little boy referred to is, of course, queen takes f6. An absolutely incredible move, one of the most incredible moves in all of chess history. Now, basically, Nezhmet Dinov is giving up the queen for two minor pieces, a knight and a bishop. There are no immediate tactics. There is no immediate attack. There is no way to immediately regain material. Instead, he is basically just saying that my two minor pieces are superior to the strongest piece that you have on the board, your queen. Now, for a long time, this game was deeply analyzed, although basically the sacrifice 
defies deep calculation and reviewed by computers, and this was considered kind of an intuitive sacrifice, one that could not really be fully justified with analysis. However, I think when you look at the game with modern neural networks, that evaluation changes. If you look with Stockfish 12 or Leela, they have the ability to really get into the long-term factors in the position, and they think that this sacrifice is fully justified. And I think that basically they show that white has an advantage in all lines after this sacrifice. I defy you with calculation to show equality for black. Now, after queen takes f6, there is an important note. First off, let me make a quick point about a tactic. You cannot try to include the intermediate move knight takes b3 because after a takes b3, you are opening up an attack on the black queen. Queen takes a1, a desperado try here allows queen takes e7, and the dark squares are just too weak for black. For example, queen a5, bishop h6, queen d8 rushing back to defend and avoid queen takes f8 mate, and then after knight d5, white is just winning with threats like uh, knight f6 check, and of course, if you capture the queen, then after the knight captures, the rook on f8 is going to fall for free. So that doesn't work. Now, Chernikov does find the best move. It is knight to e2 check. Now, this isn't going to change the structure of the position, but after knight takes e2, Chernikov is going to force Nezhbent Dinov to take a little more time to get the knight back to the square it wants to be on d5. Now, in fact, I've heard that this is the reason that Nezhbent Dinov thought so long before sacrificing the queen. He's like, I really want to sacrifice the queen, and if I can sacrifice the queen and put my knight on d5 and my bishop on d4, that sounds amazing, but I know he's going to include this knight e2 check, and then after I capture, I'm going to need a bit of time to get the knight to d5. But after thinking a long time, he said, what is my opponent going to do in the meantime? The answer he came up with was nothing. There's no way to stop me getting this knight to d5. So even if it's going to take extra time, I can still sacrifice this queen. Now, after pawn takes f6, finally accepting the queen sacrifice, we have knight to c3. That knight is headed right back to d5. And now in this position, played was the move rook to e8. Now, we're going to have some comments in a moment from Volashin, but before that, let me say that d5, which is suggested by many analysts and is considered kind of the refutation if you look at some sources um, reviewing this game, I think doesn't really hold up with neural, neural network analysis. With Stockfish 12, after knight takes d5, bishop e6, knight takes f6, king g7, and then knight back to d5, Stockfish 12 is saying, hey, this is still good for white. I mean, it's not counting material, it's just looking at the position on the board and saying, you know, white has two pawns and two amazing minor pieces for the queen, and what is the queen and black's rooks going to do in this position? Not a whole lot. And in fact, Stockfish 12 thinks that white has a pretty sizable advantage. Is this objectively winning? It's hard to say, but I think white can definitely press. In any case, played in the game was the move rook e8, and bullish in comments. Was Nezhmet Dinov able to calculate all the consequences of the queen sacrifice? During the analysis immediately after the game, I was struck by how much Nezhmet Dinov had seen at the board. But there is no genius capable of calculating all the possible attacks and defenses in this position. Even if there were no clock ticking away, ruthlessly counting off the time, we have before us a typical example of an intuitive sacrifice in which imagination and intuition come to the forefront and enable us to realize more profoundly the richness and beauty of the art of chess. Who knows? If Chernikov had played 14 d5 instead of 14 rook e8 and lost with it, analysis might have appeared demonstrating that he should have played 14 rook e8. As expected, Nezhmet Dinov hops his knight into d5, an amazing square, and he is immediately attacking the pawn on f6. Now we see Chernikov play rook to e6, defending along the 6th rank. This was the whole point of rook to e8, because he's certainly not going to have time to capture the pawn on e4. Nezhmet Dinov plays bishop to d4. At this point, he's basically achieved his master plan. Put the knight on d5, put the bishop on d4, and attack those dark squares around the black king. Now he can continue to build up with, for example, rook d1, d3, and f3, which is played in the game, and with that idea in mind, there is really no defense for black. Now king to g7, rook d1, d6, rook d3, 
And it is at this point that engines like Stockfish 12 start to go, hey, I thought you had full compensation for the sacrifice queen. I had the evaluation at 0.00, but actually you've got more than full compensation. It looks like you're winning. So after rook d3, bishop d7, there is a decisive blow available to Nijmet Dina. This is the one moment in the game where his play might be improved. The decisive move is the pretty move, knight takes f6. After rook takes f6, rook f3, the idea is of course just to win the pinned rook. The only defensive try that makes sense is bishop f5, trying to close off the f-file. But after pawn takes f5, the idea is to capture here and then capture the rook. So the f-file must be closed. But after g5, rook g3, pawn h6, and c3, or other moves at this point, but c3 is very nice, the point for black is just that there is no way to deal with this pin. The pin is immortal. The rook can never move. And the king can never move. With both of those pieces tied down to these squares, white will eventually break through. A very, very pretty possible continuation. In the game, Nezhmetdinov plays the move rook to f3. Now, this is also very strong, but at this point, Chernikov, if he was a computer, could have played rook to e5. Now, one obvious idea here is just to try to close off this bishop and give back an exchange to eliminate the strong bishop. Of course, Nezhmetdinov is never going to give up the bishop for the rook. But Black still has good countering ideas. The basic idea is to harass this bishop, try as hard as possible to sacrifice an exchange for it, and in this way, Black does have good defensive chances with computer perfect play. For example, rook takes f6 here, and bishop to e6. Attacking the knight on d5, also trying to eliminate that. If f4, going after the rook on e5, Black is saving himself just in time with rook takes e4, attacking the loose bishop, and none of the discoveries work because the bishop is loose on d4. It's also important to note that after bishop c3, black has queen c5 check, the only saving move in that position. So after rook takes e4, black is doing well in this position. In fact, even winning, white has overpressed. But backing up, after rook e5, if white realizes the vulnerability of this bishop and pulls back with bishop c3 right away, then there is queen to d8, and after rook takes f6, now rook to c8. And black's next move is definitely going to be rook takes c3. After knight takes c3, this is a position where black is close to equality. I still think that black has the harder practical task ahead, but this is absolutely the best defense available to Chernikov at this point, and possibly the only really good defensive line he had all game. In the actual game, he played the move bishop to b5 here, attacking the rook on f1, but Nezhmet Dinov is not concerned about this at all. He plays here bishop to c3, queen to d8, and knight takes f6. If Chernikov captures the rook with bishop takes f1, then after knight g4 check, whichever square the, queen, the king moves to allows bishop takes on e6. For example, king to g8, bishop takes e6, and if you capture, there is the very, very pretty knight h6 check and mate. So after knight takes f6, actually played is bishop to e2. There's something funny about this move here, not choosing to capture one rook, instead choosing to fork the two rooks, but of course Chernikov is basically right that the rook on f3 is by far the most important rook and he does need to eliminate it. Unfortunately, he is not in time and in this position, there is a winning move for white. Pause your video and try to find it. Nezhmet Dinov found and played the only winning move. Knight takes h7 check. Now, if you're following along with an engine, the engine might say that knight d7 check is also winning, but that's only true if you repeat moves and then sacrifice on h7. This idea is needed to win the game. Now, the knight cannot be captured. If king takes h7, you're not playing rook h3, which can be blocked. You're instead playing rook takes f7 check, and then you're winning the rook on e6. Black still in this position does not have time to capture the rook on f1 because of bishop g7 check, and you can use a sequence of checks to win the black queen. The end game in this position is totally winning for white, who is up a ton of pawns, and the black king is still not safe. So after knight takes h7 check actually played is king to g8. 
and now rook h3. Still, you cannot capture the rook on f1. This rook is always tempting Chernikov, but it is just never possible to take it. If you do knight g5, it doesn't matter that the knight is not defended on the square because the threat of rook h8 mate is just too strong and there is no way to stop it for Chernikov. No good way anyway. So after rook h3, Chernikov actually tries rook e5, trying so hard to close this diagonal down. It is definitely the best defensive idea, but now pawn to f4, bishop takes f1, and insult to injury. There's no need to capture here because you can just take here and your position remains dominating. You're actually down sort of a rook here, but your pieces are overwhelming. So rook c8, trying to sacrifice the exchange here, bishop d4, no thank you, I'll keep my bishop, it is way better than your rook, pawn to b5, and knight to g5. There is a threat here of bishop takes f7 check, or knight takes f7, or a lot of things. So now rook to c7, trying to defend f7, and Nijmet Dina finds a very pretty tactical sequence to finish the game. It's not the only sequence that is good, but it's certainly a memorable one. If you want to pause your video here to try to find it, it's definitely a good time to do so. So Nijmet Dina played bishop takes f7, rook takes f7, and now rook to h8 check. Always a very pretty move to see on the board. Now, of course, this idea should look familiar to us because it's very similar to what Petrosian used to beat Spassky in our number five best chess game of the 1960s. I'm not too sure about the numbering at this point. I'm getting a little bit lost. But after rook h8, the point is again a royal fork. King takes, knight takes f7, and then king h7, knight takes d8. Nizhmetdinov is just winning on material here. He plays knight c6 to defend the bishop. He does lose the pawn on f4, but after king e2, Chernikov decided that there was really no point defending anymore in this position. The knight and bishop are stronger than the rook, and Nizhmetdinov also has an extra pawn to boot. Volishin comments here, the game produced such an impression on the many participants of the championship team that none of them presented their games to the judges for the beauty prize. It was guaranteed in advance to Nezh. That certainly makes sense. You would have to be pretty audacious to submit your own effort. Oh, I played such a nice end game against this incredible and immortal game. I hope that you've enjoyed this video. If so, please do check out the playlist with the rest of the best chess games of the 1960s. It is popping up on your screen right now.